Uh, namaskar everyone. My name is Rila Hota. I am an UDC dancer and yoga practitioner. And I'm so pleased to be with you all today to share my understanding of arts and spirituality. And thank you so much for thinking to include me in your podcast, Abhijitji. I have been your follower on social media platforms. And now to speak to you and share my experiences with you is an absolute honor. Thank you, ma'am, for being on the podcast. It's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. So uh, let us uh, begin with, so you are a very eminent ODC performer. You have been so for a very long time. You have had quite a career and it's it's a career that will continue for the for as far as I can see. So I would like to understand what was your introduction to ODC dance like? How did you progress from a complete novice to a student in, uh, in Odisha dance, who were your gurus and what was your the progression from student to artist? So I started uh, learning uh, dance at the age of eight. Uh, my mother placed me under Guru Gangadhar Pradhan in Odisha and I trained uh, for about four years from Guruji. And then my family moved to Delhi and I joined Madhi Mukherjee at the Gandhar Mahavidyalaya. And she was so inspiring that uh, at the age of 15, when most of my peers were still debating whether to take arts or science in the next class, I had already decided what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, which was to dance. Then I trained under Kiru Babu for a brief while. He was such a legend, I tell you. And, but so open-minded. I think I have imbibed a certain quality of uh, self-assessment from him, which is so important for an artist. And then my, uh, what we call a Mancha Pradesh, which is uh, a debut on stage as a soloist, was in 1994. And uh, it's been a long journey since then. Right. So uh, what were your influences like? What have your influences been like thus far as an artist? I mean, as an artist, you are influenced by a variety of things. You are in inspired by spirituality, by philosophy, by various intellectual uh, things that you uh, learn and absorb and study, you're inspired by culture, by literature. So what what have your influences as, a, as an artist been like? My influences uh, have stemmed from two people in my life. The first uh, is my mother. And I do not mean that in terms of the sanskars or the value system, we all inculcate from our parents, but in my workspace. Because I was an introverted and sickly child, uh, prone to daydreaming, procrastination, and also uh, <laughs> quite depressive. And uh, she, on the other hand, uh, was and continues to be a highly creative and positive person. So from my childhood till today, she's been the constant source of inspiration and creative strength. She has, in fact, conceptualized and scripted all my dances on ancient Indian wisdom, such as yoga, tantra, Sanskrit, and more recently, the Vedam. And because she trained in Odissi dance as a child from Guru Deva Prasad Das, she has now started to choreograph all my dances as well. And she just recently released her 11th book on yoga, so you can well imagine her deep knowledge. Another important influence in my life has been the great yogi Swami Siddhananda Saraswati Ji, who is the founder of Bihar School of Yoga. Uh, and I saw him when I was about 11 years old. And he was visiting uh, the town of Sambalpur in Odisha, where we lived briefly. And his visit was a part of a week-long discourse and yoga program. And I was so drawn to him when I saw him that I wanted to leave my house and I wanted to stay with him in his ashram. And of course, that didn't go down very well with my family and they didn't allow me to see him again uh, till I was much uh, older. And Swamiji providentially invited me to perform at his ashram in Rikhyapir, uh, which is a remote uh, village in Jharkhand in India. And uh, he scheduled my performance as a part of a five-day spiritual retreat called Shat Chandi Mahayagyan. 
So on the one side was the yagya and the chanting of mantras by a group of uh, pundits. And on the other was Swamiji himself giving discourses on our Vedas and our Upanishads and all our sacred texts. And here I was dancing what I thought then uh, was just a visually pleasing art form. A technique that had to be mastered and your skills shown to large audiences for praise and name and all the material reasons. That dance too is as sacred as a Vedic yagya. I experienced in that setting because this was 1996 and at that time society had not completely recovered from a mindset that dance was just a form of entertainment or even less so. My mother had to leave uh, dance after marriage and even in Delhi I still remember uh, a spiritual group refused access to their hall for my dance rehearsal. Perhaps they thought that, you know, they see me agitate the mind instead of calming the mind, which is what spirituality aims to do. And I believe this was the remnant of a slightly contemptuous attitude towards dancers because of the Mahari tradition that Odissi grew out of. You may know that the Maharis were dedicated dancing girls who were attached to temples and who would dance as a part of the ritualistic service of the presiding deity. And this tradition had lost its original essence and had fallen into disrepute. And I had not studied uh, our ancient sacred texts of dance. And my experiences did not run that deep that I could counter-reflect. I was quite young at that time. And here was this master yogi, practitioner of high Vedic austerity, such as the Panchakani Sadhana that he had just completed, uh, where one has to face the uh, uh, the heat of five fires, four that are lit around you, and the fifth is the sun. So here the temperature, I believe, can go up to 90 degrees Celsius. So only a very, very powerful yogi and, and an enlightened being can endure this. And here he was watching my performance as it were a Divya Darshan. So this event and Swamiji were definitely a huge turning point in my thought process and it's reflected in the way I have responded to life and dancings. Right, right. So you spoke about the origins of Odissi dance from the Mahari tradition, etc. So could you elaborate a little bit more about the origins and the history of the Odissi dance? Because as far as I understand from my little under knowledge, the there is, a, there is a lot of correspondence with the Nati Shastra. That, uh, all the themes uh, do come out of that. But are the origins something that goes even beyond that to, to perhaps even older eras? Could you please elaborate upon that? Yes, you're absolutely right. We dancers talk of Nati Shastra all the time. But you're absolutely mm. right about that. That it could uh, be... I mean, we have to go by some archaeological evidence to make uh, an intellectual discourse with you. I mean, we don't know how old it is, but it could be even 4,500 years old because the sculpture of the famous dancing girl found in the ruins of Mohenjo-daro resembles a posture of Odyssey. <laughs> so, uh, um, and the, but um, initially I'll say that uh, the attitude of society towards uh, dance was uh, that of reverence. Um, uh, we don't know how uh, how much how ancient it is, but we have seen many Shaivite temples which show Lord Shiva in Odissi postures. Then we have the Udaygiri and Khandagiri caves that were built for Jain monks to meditate in, and has sculptural panels of dancing girls on their walls. Then sculptures of Buddhist gods have been found in dancing postures. And then in the tantric tradition, where the female principle is worshipped. We have the temple of Horakur that houses 64 sculptures of tantric yogins in dance postures. And Jain manuscripts have been discovered with Odissi postures in its covers and margins. So it would seem obvious that dance was understood to be an aid to meditation, a divine art form. And it even became a ritualistic art form somewhere around the 12th century AD with the growth of Lord Jagannath at Puri. 
Yeah, Mahari symptoms were held in high esteem and they were almost like priestesses and they had to undergo uh, ritual purifications before dancing, such as fasting and uh, anointing their body and also seclusion. And the other uh, important part of Odissi history, which is worth mentioning here, is the Gotipo tradition, which is very unique to Odissi. Little boys uh, in female costumes and makeup would dance. Uh, the devotional content of both Mahari and Gotipo dance was very strong. Uh, in the Natya Shastra, every dramatic act opened with a dance uh, where the dancer went and scattered flowers to the gods and the gods that have been mentioned in the Natya Shastra, the Rudra, the Brahman and Vishnu, which are, I think, Vedic gods. So I'm supposing whatever sacred texts that were prevalent at that time must have found their way into the presentation. But we don't have any existing dances of that ancient period. But later medieval texts that grew out of the Bhakti movement, starting from the 12th century Gita Govind by Jaitem, are used till today. And then you have the uh, Bhakta Saraveg and Gopal Krishna Patnaik and Sri Vanamari Das that contributed to Odissi literature. And uh, interesting to know that they were all devout Vaishnavites who expressed love for God through their creative work. Uh, apart from uh, uh, them, uh, uh, then uh, there have been other uh, texts also that have been adopted into, uh, into the Odyssey repertoire. But from here, we went to the other end of the spectrum because of political upheavals, uh, the fabric of society was eroded and the temple dancers were then employed in the royal courts and it must have been then that the idea that Odissi dance is an art form for ordinary entertainment must have started because Maharis must have lost their inner strength and then sections of society exploited that and it is such a pity that a tradition of temple dance, a sacred dance, and a meditative system became so misunderstood that it was banned altogether under the British government as a social reform measure. <laughs> what is there to reform? I mean, dance is divine. So we have to thank our gurus and scholars, such as Guru Kirachar Mahapatra and Dr. Virinda Patnaik, who have contributed to revive this dance form and get its due respect by studying the ancient texts that were available and the sculptures of dance poses in sacred spaces, the existing Mahari and Gotipur tradition, they found a very refined curriculum of Odissi dance as we know today. And so Odissi dance has... Anji? Yeah, please, please continue, please. Sorry. Ah, uh, so I was saying that um, uh, today, Odissi dance has moved to the modern performing uh, theatre, but we dance, regard the dance as a sacred act, and wherever we perform, it becomes a sacred site for us. So we will uh, decorate the performing area accordingly. Some artists will even place a deity on stage and perform ritualistic prayers. At the very least, a uh, lamp is lit to bring in auspiciousness. And as is customary in the Hindu temples and our sacred spaces, we will remove footwear before stepping onto the stage. Right, right. So uh, you mentioned that Odissi dance is found in various, uh, in Jain, on the covers of Jain texts, there are various gods and deities that are in, uh, that are sculpted in Odissi poses. So it's clearly a very ancient uh, dance form. And we know that the history of Kalinga goes back minimum 3000 years because Kalinga was trading with Southeast Asia about 3000 years ago. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's also something that uh, could be relevant. Now, the question I would like to ask you is what sets Odissi dance apart from other dance forms. There is a lot in common. Like you said, the Natya Shastra is something that many dance forms have in common. The uh, Gita Govind is something many dance forms have in common. So what is it that sets Odissi apart from various other classical dance forms in India? I would say the uh, very feminine dance called Ribhangi uh, sets Odissi a little bit apart. And it literally means uh, three bends. And so we bend our uh, head area and our torso area. 
and a hip uh, leg area. And another distinctive feature of ODC would be the torso movement that we do, uh, where the body above the waist and below the shoulder is moved from side to side in this manner, which is very pronounced in ODC dance. Then there are minor features also, uh, like the jewelry has evolved to be pure silver and the uh, headgear is made from this beautiful pristine white cork cloth, which gives our face a very unique look. Having said that, uh, Odyssey is, as you said, it's a classical dance form and it shares common texts and sources. There are scholars who write about differences in music and rhythm between the North Indian and the Carnatic styles, and they go on arguing about it endlessly. But I feel the differences are unimportant in the larger scheme of things. Right. The differences are minor and unimportant. So, so what are the, th what, what is the purpose of dance? Like you said, da dance used to be a form of devotion until it was corrupted during the time of foreign occupation of India. So what is the true and actual purpose of dance? What is its role and its relevance and context in society overall and culture overall? I have thought about it a great deal, Avijiji, and I have, I, I, I believe that the purpose of dance is to create beauty and joy and well-being and dance works because it aligns our physical and mental energies with the divine creative forces because we know everything that we see around us is at this at level energy and the human body too is a mass of energy and it is believed that the patterns of the energy flow determine the state of physical and mental health of the individual and when the original pattern gets disturbed, that's when all sorts of problems arise. Because these original energy patterns, which are designed by nature, are created and they are healing and they are blissful and they are joyful, while anything else can bring the opposite of that, which is sickness and negativity. So systems such as dance was designed in such a way as to maintain and enhance the current creative flows of the body. And beyond energy, there is consciousness. And in order to reach that subtle state, the mind needs to be introverted and concentrated. And it is said that when the mind is concentrated, then all the negative emotions that arise out of our sensory perceptions and also those that are embedded deep in our memory, they are dissolved. So th that is why dance uses symbols. You know, the gods and goddesses that we describe are at the deeper level really tools that help to hold our mind for an extended period of time, which is meditative. And new science now shows that dance and also music has at least the same effect as meditation on the brain wave, if not more. And But not all dancers are designed to go all the way, but they can still aid in our well-being. Certain dances will take us to the physical level. They will relax our body, muscles, and tendons and get our blood flow going. Then some dance forms will take us to the mental level. They will relax our minds at the conscious level. For example, a modified version of the popular Argentine tango has been seen to improve uh, balance in Parkinson's patients. Then Zumba improves mood and certain cognitive skills such as uh, visual recognition and decision making. Then there are some that will take you all the way to the transcendental levels. So trans states have been documented in Haiti and Guru dances, in the traditional Japanese dances of Bali. And one study revealed that the uh, alpha and theta activity in the brain, which is indicative of a highly relaxed state, increased during a professional dancer's recall of Salpuri, a shamanic Korean dance. And as far as Odyssey is concerned, there is no scientific study on the effect of Odyssey on the mind and body. So we have to go by our experiences that match what the Shastras say, that dance gives you a feeling of bliss, which is higher than what yogis attain through meditation. So essentially, dance was a way to keep your body's energy optimum and also to access the deepest layers of our mind. This is what I have understood. In the social context, uh, dance is important because it must be creating a more humane society. 
because when the individual is joyful, he is more likely to exude that in his interactions with others. I mean, how many artists do you know who have committed violent crimes? The worst you can accuse us of is a little jealousy and backbiting. Uh, in fact, I recently read about this pirate research that found that uh, dance movement therapy was effective in reducing aggressive behavior of elementary school children in just about 12 weeks' time. And I have personally experienced the uh, power of dance through my experience in the Kyapi Ashram. Swami Satyananji had asked me to teach dance to the girls from the local community that his ashram had adopted <clears throat> and the village was one of the most underdeveloped regions of India and Swamiji was working to uplift them in various ways and when I began teaching them in 2006 they were so timid and depressed and over the years my girls became self-confident in fact overconfident and uh, <laughs> expressive and energetic and purposeful and they went on to become productive members of their family and of their community and this was of course the result of an expanse of methods but that dance too can be one of the methods of transformation is 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 something that i have experienced because of this great yogi's vision Oh, very interesting. So this is not a question. This is an observation from me. You mentioned the correspondence between dance and uh, of better better health, dance and uh, self confidence, and so many other things. It's I I find a strange correspondence between dance and martial arts fighting forms. For instance, there is a lot of connection. There is a huge connect between the uh, martial art of kung fu and spirituality, Buddhist or Dharmic spirituality. The practitioners, mm. the monks who practice this in the Shaolin temple are actually practicing spirituality and they are under great self-control. And it's there's a lot of similarity between dance and martial arts from that perspective, right? Uh, anyway, you're just so an observation. correct. You know, yeah. you're so correct. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, metaphysical truths are expressed through all forms of art, certain form of arts, whether it is architecture or it is dance, it is martial arts, it is sculpture, um, it is painting or it is music. These are basically metaphysical truths that are expressed and that is why it is spiritual. As I said, uh, 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 it works at the energy level and it works at the meditative level. And you're absolutely right about Kung Fu. Right. So, uh, like you said, dance can have a lot of purposes. Some of them are to express yourself, etc. And and dance, in a sense, I think is in a way a reflection, a mirror of society, what society is going through. So I would like to ask you, what are the themes and the motifs and the issues that uh, that drive you and influence your, dry, your dance creations and compositions? Uh, <clears throat> to depict uh, metaphysical uh, principles through dance has always drawn me. And that is why I presented uh, dances on ancient Indian wisdom. And also each composition has been a reflection of a certain phase of my life. It has never been a theoretical quest for me. When I presented yoga in 1996, I was fully immersed in yogic practices. Then my experiences in Rikya Ashram drew me to the tantric concept of Kundalini Shakti it says that there is a sacred primordial force in each one of us uh, called Kundalini that can be awakened through specific methods, which led me to then present a dance called Vishwasya Bijan Kundalini, meaning the secret of the universe is Kundalini. Then when the unfortunate Ibrahim incident happened, we were so distraught by the brutality of that crime and the debate was raging at that time whether punishment or reformation can prevent such heinous crimes. And it was then that the yogic theory of evolution came into our minds. Because yoga says that a person thinks and acts according to his stage of evolution and that it is possible to change the quality of our thoughts and actions by evolving ourselves. And according to yoga, the individual consciousness evolves from the lower to the higher chakras. The highest chakra in human beings is the sarasra, 
and the lowest is the muladhara which is equivalent to the highest chakra in animals so the person who is in the muladhara chakra has just evolved out of the animal kingdom and therefore retains some of his more i can say baser or instinctive qualities while in the high chakras it is the divine qualities that are manifested so we decided to interweave this theory with dance and named it antaryatra meaning the inner joy and the dance opened with showing the manifestation of muladhara qualities through the nirbha incident the perpetrators acted brutally as that is the outcome of their state of evolution and then a person who uh, evolves to the middle stages like the manipura chakra will again express the emotions of that stage which are rajasic in nature that is passion and lust and anger and restlessness but at the higher anahata chakra which is our heart chakra a person is filled with positive emotions such as love and compassion so the process of evolution from what seems to be a manipura to a anahata chakra of course as we understood it was shown through the character of king ashoka known for his uh, cruel and sensual nature he transformed out of the kalinga world and became a buddhist and in the still uh, higher vishuddhi chakra which is a throat chakra then it is believed that he becomes immune to injury so we took the historical character of our own mirabai who drank poison without any harm uh, to indicate that this uh, is the manifestation of a vishuddhi chakra and then later she must have evolved to the highest chakra towards the end of her life because of the legend goes she ran into a temple in search of god and simply disappeared because her vibration was so accelerated to such an extent that nothing remained of her body and to show that this is a universal principle and not limited to india and certainly not a religious concept we also show the life of saint paraskavi who is a second century the roman christian martyr who was also not injured in spite of extreme torture done to her again indicating that she must have belonged to the higher chakras another theme uh, that i could share with you uh, was the healing power of ancient languages uh, particularly sanskrit because at that time i had just received mantra diksha which is a tradition in india where your spiritual guru gives a disciple a personal mantra to change our thoughts uh, because mantras work at the vibrational level and i'd also chanced upon an article by my mother on the power of sanskrit mantras as she used to prescribe mantras as therapy to her students and i asked her if uh, she could write a script for a dance program and she created a beautiful script and one of the items uh, explored how sanskrit sounds affect our body which is called dhvani sharira or the body of sound and the theory is that these chakras are which are energy centers of the body and control the body's uh, physiological functions contain their own sonic sounds which are called bija mantras and when a bija mantra is uttered its resonance is felt in the corresponding chakra and stimulates it into action and sanskrit language which is full of creative sounds including chakra bija mantras therefore has the capacity to enhance the health of the one who speaks or hears it a conversation between two friends went like this bhu uh, sundaram renu sundaram uh, pushpam sundaram sundaram ambaram meaning how beautiful the earth is how gorgeous the sky is and how beautiful the flowers are and if you know each uh, word ends with a uh, ram which is actually the bija mantra of our manipur chakra which is the navel chakra and which in turn controls our digestion so through a conversation between two friends we are in effect showing how our digestive health is improved so i would say that uh, ancient indian wisdom and their you know, practical relevance in our day to day life has inspired me greatly
Right. You you mentioned about the effect that Sanskrit has. It's like a divine language, and various uh, scientific studies also seem to indicate that. that. There's been very little research on that, but by now we have discovered something called the Sanskrit effect, which which says that when you even think of Sanskrit uh, shlokas or you utter them, that puts you in a meditative state of mind. And people who memorize large amounts of Sanskrit verses and uh, all that, th their brain uh, morphology is altered and the certain regions of the, of the brain develop more than other things. And it seems to be specific only to Sanskrit. So that's something that's fascinating. It seems to be a genuinely divine language, the oldest language we know of. So yeah, that, uh, that scientific study kind of corresponds to what you have uh, mentioned over here right so uh you are not just uh this uh, uh odyssey dancer you are also a yogi right so i would uh, like to understand what is the uh what is the relationship the connection between dance and yoga uh i can speak for all dance forms i have uh i have a cursory knowledge of other dance forms okay. but mm -hmm. certainly yoga and odyssey dance are closely connected with each other because the aim of both yoga and dance, uh, odyssey dance is the same that is moksha or self-realization so the methods too are similar and while yoga has different branches so there's bhakti yoga where devotion and surrender to the will of the universe is the method then we have kyan yoga or yoga of inquiry then we have raj yoga of sage patanjali where uh, meditation is the mainstay and not yoga where the meditation is on inner sounds. Then we have mantra yoga where chanting is the key and hatha yoga where uh, asanas or postures are the mainstay and so on and so forth. But Odissi is a synthesis of various yogas and therefore is referred to as natya yoga or artistic yoga. For instance, Yeah, please go ahead. Um, for instance, as I was saying, uh, we can see uh, Hatha Yoga postures in Odyssey dance. The Chakrasana in yoga is like the Argala Parana of Nartya Shastra, and Chakrasana has been seen to be beneficial for our digestive, our nervous, our cardiovascular, glandular systems. And Chakrasana also influences all our hormonal secretions and helps relieve various gynecological disorders. Then we have Tandavasana, which is like the Bhujanga Chitta Kamkarana and is known to balance our nervous system and to have a better control of the body. And there's many, many asanas like that. The main stance of Odyssey, which is called Joka, is similar to Uttanasana, which is practiced in yoga for pelvic health and to strengthen the Muladhara Chakra. And the other stance, Otrakangi, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which has the three bends of the body, now, if you know, these three areas house the three major chakras, that is the Vishuddhi, and then uh, the Anaha, and then the uh, Manipura chakra as well. And by exerting a continuous pressure on the chakras, I believe this posture activates them. Then Odyssey uses uh, instruments and the raga system of uh, musical pattern. Both of them are based on Nadi Yoga. And Nabh yogis are this, are this group of yogis that uh, believe that the chakras, uh, besides the Vija mantras, also emit seven different notes. And they found that when the original uh, note of a chakra went off key, that is when ill health manifested, and through the correct sound again, it could be rectified. And the chakra sounds were then developed into musical patterns which formed the basis of the raga therapy in India. And the music of Odyssey uses a wide variety of these recommended ragas. Then our instruments, we have the, originally we had the veena, the vardala, the flute and the cymbals. Now these sounds are believed to be existing in the cosmos as well as in the body and can be heard through inner experience because they are extremely subtle sounds. So while the Nada Yogi meditates on the inner unstruck sounds, the dancer concentrates on the same sounds but produced externally by instruments. So arrives at the same point of equilibrium. And then Bhakti Yoga 
uh, I already uh, mentioned that earlier that we have so many epics and scriptures which are uh, going to be, uh, which evoke uh, emotions in us, uh, such as love and gratitude and respect, which is bhakti. And then Raj Yoga, this is what I uh, discovered recently that one can find Raj Yoga in Odissi dance. We all know of meditation as sitting still and introverting our mind, but this is the passive form of meditation. And Odissi dance is an active form of meditation where we can clearly find different stages of Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga. So both dance and yoga follow the same processes to manage the physical and the emotional and the psychic and the spiritual aspects of an individual and therefore are very closely connected. Very interesting, very interesting. So, you, so you're saying that uh, Odissi dance is kind of like a waking for form of Raj Yoga, which is meditation. Which kind of makes a lot of sense to me because I am no expert in this. I'm a complete novice, but I know that you can do pranayam with, with your eyes open and while walking, walking pranayam. And pranayam, I think, is one of the basic uh, components or fundamentals of how you get introduced into meditation. So that is uh, really interesting. Now, uh, you said that uh, dance, Odissi dance, is one of the paths through which you can attain moksha eventually once you're uh, highly evolved and you attain a certain uh, level. What is the yogic path to self-realization? Um, like dance, yoga is a method by which you can reach the deeper layers of your mind. It's a system by which our consciousness is disconnected with the entanglement with the mind and the manifest world. In fact, the process of yoga is called yoga that is separating awareness from identification from the mind and body. And principle is the same as dance, that consciousness uh, manifests as energy, which then condenses it to, into matter. So if we wish to experience the consciousness free from matter, we have to reverse the process of evolution back to its original cause, that is involution. And why is this so important? That so many different systems were devised to do this, and so many of our Shastras talk about this. I got my answer when I studied the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where he explains that the root cause of unhappiness, whether it is conscious or subconscious, is the ignorance of one's real nature. And this ignorance leads to egoism, and not the way we understand ego, which is pride, but the yogic egoism is uh, when people identify with their mind and body, which then produces a strong sense of individuality. And this sense of ego then leads to the uh, dual aversion and attachment to things of the world. And these two tensions then lead to conflict and unhappiness and likes and dislikes. And then what he calls the ultimate glacier, which is a kind of a deep agony, and that is the fear of death. So this ignorance can be slowly dissolved by the understanding that comes from the regular practice of yoga, that by gaining more insight into the nature of the mind and then eventually being able to go beyond the mind, that is when you realize that there is this existence of consciousness in us, which is irrespective of this body. And when this awareness of this ultimate reality increases, then we are in new mind or we are self-realized. That is uh, what yoga says about uh, uh, the ultimate goal, which is self-realization. And in fact, we had uh, uh, presented uh, this as a dance form in 1996. Uh, and we had called it Atma Mukti or the uh, uh, liberation of the self, because it must be the most liberating feeling uh, to be in that state. And uh, at that time in 1986, I had just started my professional career. And so I had an urge to present my compositions rather than what the traditional pieces that I and my peers had learned from our gurus. 
And then I was fortunate that my mother came up with this idea to produce a dance on yogic philosophy, which was not a well known subject at that time. And so we showed different branches of yoga, uh, karma yoga through the teachings of the Gita, bhakti yoga through the mythological story of Dhruva from Vishnu Pura. Uh, Dhruva, as you may know, was a child prince who showed exceptional powers through the power of his devotion. And he's been described to go for months without food and water and lived largely on energy that he could absorb directly from the atmosphere. And then Raj Yoga was shown through Lord Buddha, uh, who's well known for attaining enlightenment through intense and continuous meditation. And finally, synthesis of yogas uh, through uh, Lord Mahavir Jain was shown because we believe that he seemed to have practiced many different forms of yoga. And what we wanted to say that no matter which yogic path you took, the aim was the same, that is self-realization. Right. So you mentioned that there are lots of different paths that one can take on, on one's yogic uh, journey. So what's your relationship with yoga been like? What has your evolution as a yogi looked like from the very beginning, from, a, from childhood until, until now? It's been a range, uh, uh, I tell you, according to life's experiences and our age, our desires and our needs. Uh, when I was a child, I... I was exposed to Nadi Bhakti Yoga first. I was just 10 years old and I just uh, could not reconcile with the passing of my house pet and I had not eaten for days. Uh, so somebody advised my mother to take me to the local yoga ashram. And when we arrived, the Kirtan session, which is the devotional music, was about to start. So the Acharya Swami Surupanandi asked my mother to join in that and that we would speak after the session. And after about one hour of uh, listening to their devotional music, there was a visible change in my mood. So I was taken back the next day, and after the second session, I felt completely at peace. And as long as we were in the same city, I never missed a day of their evening sessions. Uh, then uh, growing up, Hatha Yoga became a big part of my daily routine. I, I practice more, it's more for physical fitness because uh, I've always felt a certain lack of energy, which is such a drawback for a dancer. And uh, prana and yogic or yogic breathing really helped me with that. And I've also suffered from this crushing fear of the stage. And uh, for that, I practiced uh, a lot of karate kriya and dom chanting and a uh, lot of things to balance my and strengthen my nervous system. Also, recall, which is so important for a dancer. I've had to work on many yogic practices uh, to strengthen that. It's like the 51st day. It's every morning you wake up and you do kriyas to adjust your mind and body. But as uh, life's experiences unfolded, I went deeper into the spiritual aspects of yoga. I was initiated into karma sannyas, which is an initiation into the early stages of sannyas, uh, which is a system in, in India where we renounce our material desires to concentrate on our spiritual personality. And in karma sannyas, we are encouraged to stabilize our mind by adopting a certain detached attitude towards the results of our actions. Because yoga believes that it is our expectations that create neurosis and stress and therefore disease. So in order to free ourselves from that and still be able to continue to do our work and enjoy our work and good health, we have to realign our attitude, which is what Karma Sanyas aims to do. And um, at the uh, current uh, stage of life, it is the transcendental aspects of yoga that is drawing me. Because yoga uh, awakens the dormant areas of our brain so that we become our optimum version. And I've had personal experiences with yogis and masters, and I'm still in touch with them, who are in a state of peace and joy 
only because I believe they have been able to access the deeper layers of their being. So how to experience this yogic sense of non-duality? How to be able to see our past and the present and the future and to experience that kind of timelessness and then realize that there is no past, there is no future, there's only the present. Everything is just is. Then can all my sadness and negativity really dissolve? I've had glimpses, but they have not lasted. So that's the discovery and after now. Right, that's really interesting. So yoga clearly has answers and solutions to most of the problems life throws at us, whatever weaknesses we have and whatever progress we need to make. So is yoga something that anybody can start at any age? What's the importance of yoga for a common person in balancing their mind and, and body and life? Uh, I believe yoga can be started at any age, but of course it has its own methodology and experts mm. will tell you that if this is the age and if this is the condition, then you, uh, how, where do you start? You will start at the beginners, then they will observe you for a few years, then you will go to the, mid, uh, the intermediate, and then you will go to the advanced if you started soon enough. And uh, so I, I, I believe that uh, yoga can be, uh, I always encourage uh, everybody to do to, to, uh, yoga. It doesn't matter what you are and what age you are. And I, I believe yoga and uh, uh, yoga really helps to balance our personality at both the mental and the physical level, which is a very complex uh, system because they both are energies and they both have to be balanced for a balanced personality. If the physical energy is too much, then there will be aggression and violence. If the mental energy is in excess, then there will be neurosis and psychosis. So balance is the key and Hatha Yoga balances these two energies. And also there is another uh, part of yoga which is uh, which deals with our uh, most inherent nature. You know, we are born with a certain kind of uh, personality uh, from past life or whatever. I don't want to go into that. But so different branches of yogas have been described to suit these different uh, inner natures. So bhakti yoga will suit somebody who is emotionally inclined. And gyan yoga is for those who are intuitive by nature. Raj yoga is for those who have strong willpower. And then karma yoga is for those who are highly energetic. And Swami Satyananji uh, describes this concept beautifully and I quote this often. He has said that without karma yoga, you will experience unhappiness and frustration. And if you do not practice bhakti yoga, your passions will run high. And if you do not do Raj Yoga, your mind will jump around like a drunken monkey. And if you do not do Gyan Yoga, you will not know why you are doing what you are doing. And if you do not do Hatha Yoga, you will not be able to do any yoga at all. <laughs> so I would say that yoga balances our mind and body so that we can have a good quality of life. Because when we are balanced internally, we will develop better, we will make better choices. And we will know uh, spontaneously what is good for us and what will add to our lives. Our ability to withstand, you know, all the pressures, uh, uh, which then determines the way we interact with our family and friends. You know, they all start to dissolve. Indeed, indeed. So all of our culture, whether it is yoga, whether it is the various classical dance forms, everything else, all of our ethics, values, all of that originates in our ancient, deep, very ancient literature like the Vedas, the Shastras, all of that. And that seems to have still continued to some extent in the 21st century. So I would like to ask you a different kind of question. Are the Vedas, the Shastras, our 10,000 plus year old ancient culture, is all of this still relevant in some sense in the 21st century, in the age of modernity? Uh, well, Vedas and Shastras and our ancient culture, they are based on metaphysical truths, which are eternal. So they are systems through which we can manage our 
body and our mind to find some peace and some joy and some fulfillment. So how can they not be relevant uh, at any time? The Vedas, for instance, they're full of sacred chants and rituals. And we know now how rituals uh, such as yagyas purify the environment. The effect of mantras on the body is also a well-researched subject. Gayatri Mantra, the highly revered Rig Vedic Mantra, has been observed to have significant uh, improvement in our attention and memory and even anxiety. Then Vedas uh, particularly uh, defined our role in context of the family and society. For example, and I resonate a lot with this, uh, Vedas gave utmost importance to a woman's mental state. Atharva Veda says, and I quote, O wife, you shall bring bliss to all and direct our homes towards our purpose of living. Rig Veda says, May the pure, life-giving, enlightening woman be respected as mother every day so that she provides us with peace and eradicates all hatred from society. And now we know how important a woman's mind is to the shaping of the mind of the child. Research uh, clearly uh, indicates that even at the fetal level, uh, the mental state of the child is affected by the mother. And that is why we all have Garbus and Skan. Because the child then can retain any stress and express that as anger as an adult. In the post-Vedic texts, such as the Ashrama Upanishad, the Vekhanasan, Dharma Sutra, and the Dharma Shastra, they give a blueprint of life, like a guide, because they divided uh, life into four stages according to the needs, basic needs of a person. And they called it the four ashramas, the, the Brahmacharya, the Vedas, the Vantras, and the Sanyas. So the first phase was when you would study and develop your skills and receive value education or sanskars along with formal education. Then after reaching adulthood, our needs and our desires changed. So when the student returned home, he married and fulfilled his worldly desires, but in an ethical way. And then at around the age of 50, uh, our body starts to change and so do life's realities. We start to lose our parents, uh, which really shifts our perception of the world 180 degrees. So the individual was then advised to step into the third phase, which is one trust, where he gradually withdrew from his active life and spent more and more time in spiritual contemplation for his own uh, peace. And then finally, Sanyas, at 75, he lived as a recluse because the passing of one, one's life uh, from one to the other is the ultimate reality. And in order for it to be peaceful, we need to realize our true self and this needs its own methodology. So you can say that our Shastras basically worked as a guide throughout our life. The Bhagavad Gita, for example, it's such a powerful psychological tool. Isn't that something to cherish? I, I know you do. I'm just uh, saying this uh, 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 because uh, I would just want to share my thoughts with you. Uh, because there's so much that you already know. There's so many podcasts that you have already done. Uh, but in for any of your audiences that have tuned in and do not know the details, uh, this is what I, I believe, and I'm sure you, you agree with me, that ancient Shastras were devised as guides to handle the basic human nature and therefore will always be relevant. Yes, indeed. Uh we can find all the answers to all of our life's problems in our ancient culture, in the Shastras, in the Puranas, in the Vedas, all that. The issue is that today's society has changed a lot. Today we are very deeply deracinated, especially our our, our younger generations. There is, I mean, how many people still conduct yagyas? How many people still live life as per the four uh, stages of life? There is a lot of distance that we have put, uh, put between our roots and ourselves. So my question to you, 
with that context in mind is can indian culture and by extension art and dance survive in the 21st century the way things are going i believe so because uh, we always have found a way to preserve our wisdom and i mean it's as you said it's uh, it's we our indian culture has uh, has survived uh, eons and i'm sure that kind of a generation gap has existed uh, throughout uh, what you your parents must have felt that you are digressing from the culture tradition culture you feel about your children uh, so i think this is an eternal debate and it happens only because every uh, stage has its own designs um and uh, uh, so i'm very hopeful and also you know like our yogis have always gone into seclusion and whenever a society was threatened and emerged at an appropriate time to share their knowledge like our own mahari dancers that gave way to the goti pot tradition that helped in reviving the odissi as we know today uh, i uh, i see no reason why indian culture and art and tradition would not be in continuation as it's been for so many years because basically it resonates with as i said our it's in sync with our innermost uh, desires right that's a very hopeful note i'm really glad to see to hear that ma'am uh, now what are some active things we can do in order to make indian culture more relevant than what it is today how can we make indian culture thrive again any any active steps we can take in that direction i think education if people know the true value of our cultural heritage they will definitely be inspired to cherish it more and you mm-hmm. are doing such valuable work in this field thank you and the, I, I i i like the fact that you you speak in such an engaging way and then you make things so accessible so if you are talking about uh, yeah, any any historical uh, whatever it is you're talking about they are not light subjects and you have uh, uh, thousands and millions of views it's because you uh, uh, you you are speaking uh, in a way that is uh, that is drawing people towards you that means they value what you are saying they value the content not only how you are saying but the content of what you are presenting so i think more such arts and culture appreciation programs could happen it's up to us and Indeed. government of course is quite encouraging to artists and cultural organizations and we are grateful for the support but there is huge scope for more grants and schemes and i believe the importance of culture in the stability of society must be understood by the government and also if some scientific temperament can be brought in i think there would be a wider acceptance of the efficacy of our arts and culture if for instance parents understood that arts and culture training may be an enjoyable way to keep the child stress free which will then only enhance their abilities in whichever field they want to pursue i believe they would be more vigilant in including arts in the daily routine of the children i could not agree more rilaji uh, culture and art uh, should be an essential part of one's life one's upbringing and like you said the scientific temperament needs to be brought back into india india is the homeland it's the birthplace of actual science whichever science you talk about astronomy physics uh, mathematics all of that so yes you make some very very important points we need to uh, there there needs to be a little bit of sense more state support to culture for instance we have now something called the world yoga day but why don't we have a global standards institute of yoga or some uh, or some universities of yoga if the government could do that it would certainly uh, give a massive fillip to our own culture so i hope the government does something like that there is like you said so much scope for these things to be done now uh, you have been collaborating for a, for the longest time with artists with traditional artists from various parts of the world from all over the world could you speak a little bit about that what kind of work are you doing in collaboration with them I have collaborated with uh, traditional and uh, classical and uh, folk and contemporary artists uh, from many parts of the world and but the most challenging and interesting collaboration uh, would perhaps be the Ram Leela which we presented in 2014 and it was a cross cultural collaboration of opera from Italy 
and Yakshagana from Karnataka, Udilya Chok from West Bengal, and Odissi uh, from Odisha, and Manipuri from Manipur, and Kathak from Delhi. And it was performed to a live orchestra of about 50 Indian and Western musicians. So can, you can imagine the challenge. There was no common language uh, excepting the language of arts. Mm -hmm. So to see so many worlds um, so far apart uh, unite through the Ramayana was a very satisfying experience. And then the grandeur was on a different dimension altogether. And I played the role of uh, Sita and enjoyed it thoroughly. Right. So you also have uh, this uh, very interesting society called the Rays of Wisdom Society. So could you please uh, speak about what work you're doing with that? I founded the Rays of Wisdom Society in 2006. And mm -hmm. it is a registered non-for-profit under the Delhi Government Act. And at that time, I felt the need to do two things. Uh, one was to curate an event that I would have liked to attend and also to perform it. And the other was to produce dance choreographies on spiritual systems. And the government was supporting financially uh, cultural organizations. So we uh, worked with the Ministry of Culture and the ICCR and different state departments of tourism uh, to hold the International Ancient Dance Festival and Symposium. I curated the event in such a way that it consisted of both lectures on the therapeutic aspects of dance and music and allied arts, um, followed by performances. And through ancient arts, we wanted people to know that you did not train in arts only with the aim to become a professional dancer. Arts is a stress buster and the beautiful part is that both the artist and the viewer are equally affected. And whether you are a homemaker or whatever profession you are in, learning an art form as a hobby class or even attending an arts event can be equally elevated. And we also produce different dances under the Ray's banner. And one of our uh, first productions was on the uh, poetry of Nobel laureate Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. And it is common knowledge that he was a great philosopher artist who would express Vedantic wisdom in his poetry, but there was no creative work on this aspect. Most artists were uh, performing on the dance dramas that he has written. But because of my interest in spirituality, we decided to present a thematic dance on the hidden spiritual messages in his poetry. So if you'll permit, I'll uh, share a few. Um, I would go a little bit in detail uh, because uh, it is something uh, which really touches my heart. Uh, the dance opened with the poem Domar Dina, uh, where Tagore has described musical sounds which is clearly the experiences of a Nadi Yogi while in deep meditation. Then in the poem Dui uh, which uh, we showed, he has described a conversation between a caged bird and a free bird, which is interpreted as the eternal st struggle and conflict between our lower and higher minds, our material and our spiritual minds, you can say. One wants to seek the comfort of the material world, while the other wants to soar high in the spiritual world. Then we showed an Abhine, uh, Nirchara Sopnabhanga, where Tagore has depicted beautifully the awakening of the individual soul and how it yearns to merge with the universal soul. He's taken an example of a drop of water that wants to break free out of a dark cave and then the joy and excitement it feels to go out and merge with the ocean. And then was the poem Ratheyatra, where Tagore uh, well, des uh, describes the famous Jagannath uh, Ratheyatra, where the deities are taken on a chariot and thousands and thousands of people walk along to get a few skins and uh, get divine blessings. And he says in a very satirical way that the path on which the people are frustrating starts to think that it is God. 
uh, the chariot in front of whom the people are praying thinks it is God. And even the deities themselves start believing uh, that they are God when the real God that is within us is looking on and laughing. This is the Vedantic concept of Aham Brahma Asmi, meaning that I am God. Because in the ultimate reality, we all have the same divine consciousness, but in potential form. So finally, in the last dance, we end with the poem Sundara, which uh, explains the joy and ecstasy of an enlightened state. And um, uh, ancient arts uh, festival, we uh, I think we have finished with the seventh edition, and the eighth one is coming up. And our productions have been presented in important international conferences, such as the BRICS and Kapan and CBC Global Meet of the Government of India. And we work very hard, and uh, raise is now in the outstanding category of the Ministry of Culture. Right, right, right. Um, apart from these pursuits, what other projects are you working on and what would you like to work on in the future? So you obviously are involved in dance and choreography and, and compositions and all that. But I, I, I believe you recently were awarded an honorary doctorate as well for the contributions that you have done to to society and culture. Anything else that you're working on right now or would you like or would like to work on in the future? Uh, I have recently completed uh my research project on the healing aspect of dance as a senior fellow with the Ministry of Culture. Uh, you and I have exchanged notes on this and have tried to meet earlier, uh, but I felt that this research would enrich my conversation with you. And uh, currently I'm working on converting this book into, uh, in this work into a book format so that it becomes more accessible to people. Uh, and in this project, I have studied the Nati Shastras and the Yogic texts, and I have also made a comparison with other healing art forms. And I have concluded that no Odissi movement is random or insignificant, but a very well thought of healing system. So I have tried to include research about how the Indian Raga system affects brain waves, how enacting love strengthens our stress response, how does drumming alter our brain functioning? And how do uh, hand gestures and mudras affect our biochemistry? And uh, I have also explained how Odissi contains the major stages of Patanjali's Ashtang Yoga, uh, which is Ayama and Niyama, and Asana, Prana, and Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. <laughs> you know, it is interesting what you said about Pranam earlier, because the only stage of uh, Patanjali's Ashtang Yoga which I could not find was Pranam. <laughs> so I have to do some more research, I think. And uh, in future projects, I don't know a bit, because spirituality teaches us not to look into the future because life can at any time throw you a curveball. And then the way I have evolved in my life uh, through different experiences. I never thought I would uh, go the direction that I'm going. Uh, but I would like to say this, that uh, I would like to continue with deepening my knowledge of arts and spirituality, because I have been a practitioner of dance and yoga all these years. But it is only recently that I have started to delve into Gyan Yoga. And this has given me so much solace and, and at, at a really poor phase in my life. So I'd like to continue to understand the deeper meaning of dance with more academic work while also deepening my experiences in dance. Right. So Rilaji, you've taken us on an entire roller coaster of a very wide landscape of culture, not just Odissi, Odissi dance, also philosophy, spirituality, yoga, and uh, and uh, music as well. So much more. And I think we have just uh, touched the surface of all these all these areas. There is so much more to unpack. So hopefully in the future, I would like to have you again, and maybe we could go delve a little deeper in, into some of these aspects. But thank you very much for being on the podcast. It's been an absolute honor and a great pleasure. And is there anything, any parting words you would like to offer to the audience? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first, I, again, I 
congratulate you and thank you so much and your podcast is so educative and diverse in its topics and for all those who have uh, tuned in today uh, thank you so much and i do hope that whatever i have shared uh, today is meaningful to you in some way thank you so much thank you rilaji thank you so much